Hi everyone and welcome to the new Play UK kickoff. After several exciting additions across the Western Balkans, including live events and online sessions, British Council is delighted to announce the launch of a brand new all digital series of Play UK. I'm Yubica and I will be hosting these online sessions in the following months. For those joining us for the first time, it's important to know that Play UK is a platform that encourages collaboration between artists and IT professionals and provides learning, mentoring and networking and the networking opportunities to the game development community in the region. This season, we are beyond thrilled to work with Marie Folston, an award winning creative producer and curator. We have also been listening to your feedback and with uh, Marie's expert input, we have produced a playful and inspiring Play UK program that will bring together creatives working in video games from across the UK and the Western Balkans. But let's hear more about it from Marie herself. Marie, hi, and uh, thank you for being the creative force behind uh, Play UK. Could you tell us more about yourself and what we can ex uh, uh, accept. Um, well, sorry. <laughs> and, yeah, and uh, what we can expect from uh, this new edition of Play UK. Thank you, Yubitsa. Yes, uh, as, as you have introduced me already, my name is Marie and I'm a playful curator and creative producer and director, and I specialize in video games and playful arts. And I'm really, really honored to be stepping into the curatorial shoes of Andrew and Craig from We Throw Switches as the program curator for this brand new virtual season of Play UK, which will be running from now and through till uh, March 2021. Um, yeah, and so we're kicking off today with the first in our fortnightly salon talk series. And for these events, we invite you to come sit down, maybe lie down or maybe even walk around, relax and listen to some great talks and insights from amazing UK creatives working in and around video games. Tonight, we welcome Catherine Johnson, Richards Hogg and Richard Haggett as they speak with Jordan Erica Weber about the creative collaboration behind their new game, I Am Dead. But today's event is just the start. Over the next few weeks and months, we'll be revealing an inspiring lineup of playful expert speakers who will be joining us at these salon events, from streamers to curators to developers, and maybe even some theme park ride designers, um, and of course, many, many more people from many other disciplines. In particular, in November, we'll be announcing the details of a brand new mentorship scheme for game creatives based across the Western Balkans and sharing some little teasers and insights for other playful plans and virtual showcase events that we've got coming up in 2021. So yeah, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you to the team uh, at the British Council for entrusting me with steering uh, this new season of Play UK uh, as a sort of digital program. And now I want to introduce you to and hand over to the ever delightful Jordan Erica Weber, who will be our host for the next hour, who will be speaking to the team behind I Am Dead. Hello, Jordan. Hi, Marie. I can't believe you've promised I'll be delightful. <laughs> that's something to live up to. It's, uh, I think you know, it's late, it's in the evening. <laughs> delightful as standard. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try my best. I'm so happy to be here, especially because I was involved with Play UK, gosh, a couple of years ago now. I got to go over to Sarajevo, which was really, really cool. Not something I would have been able to do otherwise. If anyone watching met me when I came to Sarajevo, it's really, really great to have you here. And I am super excited to talk about this game in particular. I played it over the weekend and although I wouldn't recommend playing it all in one go, I think it's the kind of game that you want to play in bits. I did find it utterly charming and it does something that very few games manage to do. It really made me feel some things. Um, to get an idea of what the game is like, I think we're going to show a trailer just so that you can get a sense of what the game is. Is. So if we can bring that up, uh, this is the trailer for I Am Dead, the game we're talking about today. Third time's a charm. Oh, hello there. I'm Boris Lupton. I was the curator of this museum on the beautiful island of Shelmiston. And let's get this out of the way right now. I am dead. But it's not a big deal. Oh, hello, Sparky. Hello, Morris. Are you showing them your ghostly powers? Oh, yes. One thing about being dead, I can do some new things. We're using Morris's trick to track down some other ghosts here on Shelmiston. Right now, 
We're looking for Ogden Beckett by finding his treasured possessions. Ah, oh, this must be his ship in a bottle. Ah, here's the cue for the toast. Oh, the fish folk love toast. Mm. Come on, Morris. Let's go visit the lighthouse. Ah, this is where my old pal Pete Noach lived. He used to run a yoga retreat here, which is now run by a robot, of all things. Ah, here's Pete's grapefruit tree. Oh, it's lovely inside this, isn't it? Morris, we need to find the ghosts. Otherwise, the volcano will destroy the island. Sparky, I didn't want to worry them about the volcano. If we keep looking inside these lovely objects, we'll find the ghosts and save Shelmiston. <laughs> Oh, shoulder's muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> I've got a mute button on my microphone and on the computer, confusingly. <laughs> Hopefully, seeing that trailer will have given you some idea of what the game is like if you haven't played it. Um, but don't you worry, we are going to go into depth in some of the different aspects of the game, specifically the story, because we are very grateful to have the writer with us as well. Uh, I am going to let the people that we have from the team introduce themselves so that they can talk through exactly what they did on the game and maybe what else you might know them for as well. So shall we start with Ricky since we've heard from him already? Hello. Um, my name is Ricky Haggart. Uh, I run a studio called Hollow Ponds, a small video game development studio. We're based in London, um, but we're pretty much a distributed team. So we work with folks from sort of all over, really, mostly UK based. Um, made games such as I Am Dead, Loot Rascals, Wilmot's Warehouse, um, in, often in collaboration with the next person that's going to get introduced, I think, probably, which is Richard Hogg. Do my job for me. Sorry. <laughs> Hello, hey, Britt, Dick. Uh, I'm Richard Hogg. I, so I've been making games with Ricky for about 12 years um, with a little bit of a break at one point, but um, my, my background's in art and illustration, but I guess over the course of my collaboration with Ricky and all the other people that we work with on, on the games that we work with, I've got more involved in, in the broader um, sort of process of game design. So I, I, yeah, I, I feel like I'm responsible for lots of different aspects of this game, um, but I guess my speciality is, is what it looks like, if that makes sense. And then we're very privileged as well to have another member of the team. Kat, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, hello. I'm Catherine Johnson and I'm a writer, mostly books for young people, uh, YA and middle grade, but I also do telly and film. But this is the first game that I've ever had anything to do with and uh, um, it was just really good fun. I, I'm not, I'm nothing to do with the games industry. I've played some games some time ago. I'm not an aficionado so it was totally new for me. That's amazing and we're going to talk a bit more about that later actually because I think I'd like to hear about what it was like for you as someone who hasn't worked in games before. But first I think we'll start with the origins of the game because a lot of people seeing that trailer will be wondering how on earth you came up with this idea. It's definitely very different from the games that have come before. So I guess probably that's going to be Dick or Ricky who's going to have the origin story. Do you want to, do you want to start Dick? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I muted. Like a lot of the things we do, it has very it has various different origin points. Um, I think there are two aspects of this game where I can kind of trace back the origins. And one is this idea of wanting to make a game where you see inside things and you get to you know, you probably saw in the trailer that you get to see to look at objects in this kind of special way where you can kind of slice away the the surface of the object and and you and kind of peel away and, and look inside and you can do it with things like um, fruit and vegetables and cakes all the way up to big things like buildings and ships and and uh, see all the stuff that's going on inside those um, and the idea for this um, came quite a long time ago me and Ricky we're always just talking about like ideas for video game mechanics and I think I'd seen um, 
I'd seen a, an animated GIF where someone had put some fruit for a, through an MRI scanner and I showed it to Ricky and I said, I want to make a game that feels like this, I think. Uh, uh, Ricky, would you agree with yeah. that so far? Yeah. And um, yeah, that's one of that's one of the one of the aspects, isn't it? And then you and then you start looking at there's other sort of prior art of this, like looking at like where people have taken real things and sliced through them. And you get this kind of beautiful animation that comes just from sort of experiencing that object through its depth. Um, We've got an example of that. Haven't yeah, we? should we what? show Wood Swimmer? Um, right. I think it's really interesting, Dick, that you mentioned just seeing a seeing a GIF and uh, that inspiring wanting to make a game about that, because that seems like the origin story for quite a lot of popular recent indie games. I feel yeah. like Untitled Goose Game started similarly. Yeah, they well, yeah, just a picture, a, a particular picture of a goose, I, I believe. Yeah. So this isn't the GIF that I saw, but this is a very similar thing. And in fact, if anything, it's better. It, it's a it's a film that somebody made where they um, progressively sliced away wood and then photographed the end grain and made a stop motion animation from from that so you can see yeah it was at the start it was very technically difficult to make this game and having films like this on hand to sort of give us this really tangible example of like yeah when we get this working this is definitely going to be cool because yeah. here's a real life example of it being cool. And so we know we can, you know, when we we be able to make this, it will have it will be cool in the same way, I think. Yeah. And our yeah. game does it in a, our game looks very different to this. You know, our game has very simple graphics and it's quite simple flat colour schemes. But I think you still get that same kind of feeling that you get when you watch one of these films. You know, you get that it almost is a kind of weird, satisfying feeling of seeing seeing the insides of something in this in this kind of a quite unique progressive way if that makes sense yeah. yeah and then that's that's one aspect and then yeah. the other aspect yes. is is the storytelling side of things yeah we'd made a game so the game we'd made before this was a game called ho hokum which has no um dialogue in it and it has no writing in it and although it is kind of full of stories like the whole time we were making that game we were telling ourselves stories about what's happening you know in this particular bit of the level or particular bit of the game we'd be like oh this is where this this person lives and this is what what happens here and we knew all what all the stories were but but from the player's perspective it was very much a case of of having to make figure that out for themselves um and maybe invent their own stories and or maybe kind of try and discover what what we were what our intention was which is kind of interesting and nice but it left us with a kind of craving to make something that's very different to that. We want it, le it left us feeling like we really wanted to make a game that had like explicit storytelling in it, where you where you learn about people and places and their lives and a thing that happens in the way that you learn about those things if you watch a film or read a comic. Um, and that that was a real. Um, yeah, that's one of the, the cornerstones of of, of 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 how we made this game and what why we wanted to make this game. So. And presumably that is why you ended up bringing Cat on board, uh, having no experience of making a story rich game like this one before. Uh, how did you end up going down that road? How did you end up getting a writer? Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Apparently it's Cat's turn to talk. <laughs> Yeah, Kat, do you want to talk about this? Well, I mean, I I live quite near Dick in Hastings and I know Dick's partner. Actually, I know Dick's partner's work before I knew Dick. And um, uh, Dick knew I was a writer um, and he asked me about storytelling, about narrative. He asked me to explain narrative. And although I've done lots of novels and lots of other stuff. My journey into writing has been like to get more and more story focused. I, I have worked on soaps and things. So the, the absolute basics, this is your five act structure, I said to him. And we met in the pub and I, I gave him homework, you know, little stories in five beats, which Dick went away and did. And I think a lot of the, the characters in the game, I mean, you had a lot of drawings. I did see some drawings quite, no, it was after that. Yeah. It was the, the story first, wasn't it? Yeah, I think the first thing that happened was that you you giving me kind of almost like uh, um, just giving me an idea of how to think about structuring a story. And I yeah. I remember I went away to um, a place called Topsham in um, in 
Dor- well, it's near Exeter, somewhere yeah, in England. It's like a seaside place. And I spent a week there and I just wrote all these stories and each story was just five sentences. So it was like an, each one was like an outline for a story. Mm-hmm. And um, and that was based on the kind of coaching that, that you that Kat had you'd given me, Kat. And then, but then when I got back, we sort of started talking about it in more detail and um, and it kind of just organically turned into you being the writer on the game in a way that I can't really remember exactly how that happened, but it just felt like a really natural thing, I think. It, it was very, I mean, I've done a lot of, you know, these people, you know, the characters, some of them you already had names for, some of them sort of came out of situations that you had already. It was, like you said, completely organic. And I felt, I didn't feel like you were just giving me stuff and then I was processing it. It was like sitting around with Ricky as well and just throwing all these ideas in the pot and thinking, you know, or, or, and bringing stuff to, to meetings and going, well, you know, what about this? And because I think the best stories, although, yes, I'm I am all about structure, but they do need that organic growth to them that, you know, this happens, this happens, maybe that happens, maybe this happens and you go down the wrong way and then you go down the right way. And you that way you're finding out more about the world as well, because it's always how do your characters, these are the people, operate in the world in, in any story, whether it's a game story or a book story, or, or any kind of story. Yeah, perhaps, perhaps we should contextualise this a little bit. Um, I'm just concerned that someone listening to us talking about this don't know what we're talking about in the sense that they haven't seen how the how the game delivers stories, if that makes sense. Yeah, Yeah. now would be a good time to watch the, the clip yeah. that we have. I'm going to share the screen. <laughs> should have audio this time. I'm going to turn it up. This, this video is a little bit quiet in the talking. So we're going to see a memory here. We were 14 when we started going out. Me and my friend Cassia had started a beach clean at the weekend and Ogden turned up with his mate Godfrey. I had no idea Ogden liked me. He was the tallest in our year and we all fancied him. By the time we reached the little cove at the north end of the beach, he'd asked me to come to a concert he was playing in. I said yes. He'd been going out for a few years when I applied to Floristry College on the mainland. I didn't tell Ogden. I didn't believe I'd get in and didn't want him to think I was trying to get away from him. Ogden might have looked mature and confident, but he was a gentle soul, not nearly as sure of himself as he looked. But I did get in, and he was gutted. I felt terrible. I didn't want to hurt Ogden. He said he didn't mind, but I could see he was covering. My last week on Shelmerstone was really hard. Every time I saw him, it felt so strained, and I couldn't sleep. Finally, on my last night, I made a decision. I would take an apprenticeship at the garden centre on the island instead, so we could stay together. It felt like the right thing to do. I would tell Ogden in the morning. But when I opened the door the next day, I found Ogden's sousaphone left on the doorstep. I was terrified. What did it mean? What had he done? I ran down to his house, my heart in my mouth. His mum, she never did like me, was a little bit smug. She had told me Ogden had sailed off to New Zealand. He was headed to Christchurch, she said and didn't know when he was coming back. Then she shut the door. I was more than a bit tearful, but, you know, looking back, I think we both needed to have a bit of an adventure. So, the structure of the game is kind of a a hidden object game. And the things that you're going to find in this game are are things which are important to the characters you're looking for. So in, in this bit of the game, the player's looking for this character called Ogden Beckett. Um, and who is a ghost. Who's, who's now dead, yeah. And and so so that was a memory um, of Ogden um, belonging to his widow, Sally Mapes, and resulting in a particular object. In this case, it's the the idea of him sailing away on this on this on this ship. 
Um, and then the player kind of has that ship in a bottle that they, they need to find um, as a, a kind of, it's like a kind of one of Ogden's mementos. So the game has a whole ton of stories about these characters who were once living and now are no longer living. And, and, and the stories are all by living people who remember them and they all culminate in objects to find. That's broadly the structure of the game. It's kind of a 3D hidden object game. Um, when beautiful. it came to designing those objects and the stories that go with them, what came first? Did you decide on the objects you wanted the players to find and then write stories around those? Or did you pick the characters first and then find objects that would fit with that character? Like what was the kind of order there? It massively varied, didn't it? I think it's <laughs> kind of <laughs> muted, maybe? Dick is. Um, it's different, it's different. Yeah, I'm muted. I'm not muted now. Yeah, we came at it from like diff different directions. Um, like um, some, sometimes you'd have a really strong sense of what those objects are. I think there's some art here, actually. I think yeah, there's I'm actually, just I'm just going to. Yeah, there's some good. Here we are. Look, that's a good example. Um, I think I think in some cases we had stories which, uh, you know, some of the stories that Dick wrote originally or mm. ones that Cat wrote that we just really liked the stories. Um, some of them came out of the characters. So like one thing that Kat did right at the start, um, which I wasn't expecting was to write these big biographies, like pay, you know, a couple of pages of writing about the character and, and their lives. And certain stories just were suggested by that. In other cases, there were objects that were like, this is a cool object, like a ship in a bottle mm. in this game in which you slice away things. Like in our game, all glass is solid. <laughs> it's all like opaque. And like the idea of slicing away a ship in a bottle is just a really cool thing. So sometimes, it was like we there were specific objects, um, so it was a real mix of things. And sometimes, sometimes the stories changed, but we wanted to figure out how to keep the object. And sometimes it was the reverse. Sometimes we really, really liked the story, but we we didn't. The object wasn't quite right. So it, there was a lot of like you know mixing it up. Mm. I'm interested to hear about those character biographies because the characters in this game are so believable, despite some of them uh, not being human, which we'll talk about later. But um, Kat, I wonder how you came up with all these different characters. What's that process like? Again, some of them, some of them you already had with names. Some of them, um, you, um, some of them, you know, were just names. Some of them um, were completely. Uh, um, made up or you know after I, I got involved but you have to write uh, the only way I've ever written anything whether it's for telly no if, if it's for telly and this is like film or telly you have to know who that person is before you make them speak or do anything so that's like it's like doing sketches it's like Dick doing sketches it's like oh what do they look like from this angle how did they get like that and it's important because then when you come to write about them, they will be more real. And it's a bit of fun. You get to know them. You think, oh, yeah, well, they'll do that. They're not going to do that. I, uh, I really enjoyed that process. It's like it's a really fun process, just inventing a person and then having conversations about that person, about what they might be into, what they might not be into. Mm. And that in itself, like that's not writing a story. It's right. It's like designing a person. And, and that, that in itself is just a really fun thing that I would recommend to anyone you know as a thing as as a, as a part of making video games that's that's a really cool thing in itself but ricky can we see some of the concept art yeah thank you it'd be really so great to get dick to talk about the kind of world building and how much of that just comes from the visuals let's 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 look at some of the um the stuff so ogden beckett's level is set on the key side and you know where there's a lot of boats and there's a bunch of buildings which are very reminiscent of hastings <laughs> yeah, there's some actual photos oh, from Hastings. <laughs> Hastings is a town in 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 Britain um, on the south coast, and both me and Kat live in Hastings, and that that's how we know each other. Mm -hmm. And so this I is just. Um, used to live there. Did you really? Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> this is this is just uh, like literally me walking around taking photos, but then also going and um, yeah, like drawing, just just working out all the stuff that's going to be in the game, and some of it's like in real, some of it's stuff that's really close to things in real life where I've gone to a museum or I've gone in, into the sort of the old fishing area in Hastings and and done sketches and done drawings and then other things that are, um, are taken from other places um, like there's a chandlery in the game which is a chandlery is a shop where you buy all the stuff for boats and it's actually based on a chandlery in London in central London rather than in Hastings but um you know that's the beauty of this kind of thing you can just you can pick and choose things from different places and, and put them together this drawing can you go back to that one ricky that with the buildings 
this drawing is really interesting because it is just a, a little sketchbook drawing but but the actual way this particular bit of the game ended up looking is very close yeah really to how there's so much in this drawing which is which is pretty much like if you look at the kipper company sort of near the top right that's pretty much in game as it is there in that sketch yeah. which is quite um it's quite weird for me to look at that now because it only probably took me 30 seconds to draw and yet it's now like a major part of a video game it's weird <laughs> <laughs> So in the process of building this world, like you said, you know, you drew so much inspiration from this real town that you live in and that you know so much about. And so much of this game feels so real. The people feel so realistic. And yet there's this whole other side to it. You've got fish folk and artists who have apples for heads and things like that. I'm sure Ricky has some pictures of them somewhere as well. So how did you land on, on that kind of aspect and how did you... I'm interested in that contrast between the the realism and the the mundanity almost of these everyday characters, and then these these kind of weird magical realist aspects to the game as well. Yeah, I I don't even know whether I would say we landed on it as opposed to it's just a thing that kind of happened almost in a late in a sl slightly lazy sloppy way, <laughs> in that I just find myself drawing. You know, I'm thinking of artists, say for instance, I'm thinking of, you know, I'm trying to make these artists quite different to um you know there's the local people who live on the island and then these artists are people who come from the mainland and they're quite outrageously dressed and they're quite um they maybe quite pretentious people and i was and you know and, and so i can do that with how they dress and what their hair hair's like and that but i can also just go well look i'm going to make this guy's head an apple in and it's quite a, an easy decision to make and it's quite um it's quite a frivolous thing to do, but I quite like it as just as a sort of um, just as a just as a sort of way of breaking the rules of like reality. But at the same time, you know, you, it is very much grounded in reality. Like, and ex I love things like that. You know, in in um, I love artists that do that. Like another really a good example of someone who I really admire um, is you know the artist Lisa Hannawalt, who who's really famous for doing all the character design for the TV show BoJack Horseman. Uh, and yes, in Bojack Horseman, some people are animals and some people are hum just normal humans. And it's set in the it's set in present day in in Los Angeles, but it it some you know about half of or maybe sixty percent of um of the people in the world are animals, and it's never really explained why. And it's just the nature of the I don't know. It's just like a weird twist on the world that that, mm -hmm. that somehow. The counterbalance between that and the kind of realism in in that program is really interesting, and and I, I, I guess it's a similar thing that we've strived for here. Like the thing that the thing that was just on the screen with the birds. Um, there's a whole like class of characters in this game who are who are all birds, so, and they're all tourists. So they're all people that have visited they visited the island as like package tourists, um, and uh, they they don't really mix. You know they they do that thing that. That we do when we're tourists where you go to a foreign country and you don't really you don't actually you know your interaction with the place is on a very surface level you just go around taking photos and you stay with your own kind and so by making all of these tourists this kind of colorful all these colorful birds kind of um kind of um exaggerates that effect i guess in a, in a hopefully in a kind of humorous way yeah if that makes sense it makes perfect sense thank you <laughs> there's there's so much rich story to this game in a way that really does contrast with your with your previous games and i i loved your previous games that isn't meant to be a criticism they're just very different beasts and i wonder ricky how did that feel for you going from these games that were you know they were two-dimensional and they didn't have a lot of story content to to this where you were suddenly dealing with all this plot and characters yeah i mean i think we um I think the thing that helped us at the start is that like quite early on, you know, in that process, we, you know, we had some good ideas, I think, for characters and little stories and the little memories are quite nice, sort of quite manageable things. And quite early on, we had like, you know, the memory stories are like kind of, um, you know, they're they're like five or six panels of a comic with some little writing. And, you know, that that's the whole thing. And, and, and we and that kind of gave us a bit of confidence. Um, but the process of building the whole game, the whole arc of the game, you know, the, the game also has an overriding story with mm. some ca the, the character who the player is, Morris Lupton, who's the guy that at the start of the game 
finds himself dead and isn't sure what he's supposed to be doing and you know goes on quite a journey um, which involves saving the island um, and that process was originally quite daunting I think for Dick and I who never really tackled such a thing and 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 it felt really kind of um, it felt quite quite, quite you know it's quite a complicated thing there's lots and lots of moving parts you know you're not only making a video game in which you've got to make satisfying puzzles you're also building all the 3D art that's got you know that has stuff inside it and all of that 3D art is to, are, are scenes which are also places that these people lived in it's their homes with all their stuff um, and then there's also this overarching story that kind of carries you through the game um, and it, uh, there were definitely points at which it felt like we'd bitten off a lot and um, and also, you know, I think I think that, you know, as somebody who's used to like, you know, um, you know, do game design and programming is the thing that I mostly mostly do. And, you know, it, that 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 is basically problem solving the whole time. You're just like, you know, you're just like shuffling things in and out and you're like, oh, that doesn't work. Take that away. We'll try this, change that, tweak that. Um, you know, that feels you know very natural to me. But I think tr doing that with story and world building felt quite scary and and, and and unusual until I realized I guess mainly just from working with Kat that like the problem solving side of things in storytelling and world building it's just the same like it's it's just all the same stuff and it's totally natural and normal to just be like oh well that doesn't work get rid of that add this just try this and just you know until until the thing kind of makes coherent sense absolutely absolutely especially especially when you've got um a, a range of characters like this you know the central sort of philosophy of the island you know pinning that down and how that works and make sure making sure even though the some of the people are fish people and have apples for heads making sure there's like a kind of emotional truth because really they're just people anyway um i think once you sort that out it, it is it, it is problem solving it is all problem solving like ricky said i think in a minute, we're going to talk about one of the central themes of the game, which is obvious from the title, death. Um, but before we get on to that, I just wanted to remind the people watching that you can ask questions at the end of this conversation. So if you have any questions for Dick, Ricky or Kat, please type them into the Q&A box and we'll have someone monitoring that so that we can ask them in about 20 or 30 minutes uh, after we've talked about death, which is what we're going to do now. Um, so death as a topic is something that people often shy away from um if you don't mind me just uh talking about myself for just a second i just released a documentary on radio 4 that is all about uh how video games tackle death and in fact how video games can memorialize real people so this is something that people keep asking me now is why are you talking about death people don't like talking about that so i'm curious how you came up against that when you decided to make this game i mean it's in the name People know that it's about death. How did you feel about it and how did you decide how to approach it? Uh, Dick? Yeah, I, it's a tricky one, isn't it? I don't like I don't like thinking about death that much either. But at the same time, it, it kind of occurred to us that there was an opportunity here to make something that talked about death in a very different way to how probably a lot of games do. And um, and I, I, I personally, so I, I don't know, a little bit of, a thing about me although i make games and i play a lot of games i have i don't really like games with much violence in them and and one thing as i've got older that i find in, increasingly difficult is games that are full of death and in a kind of really unnecessary way um so maybe we were thinking about making a game where the death felt more like it, it there was a, bit, a a bit more like how death touches us in real life as human beings but also it's kind of got a reason it's got a reason for ex being in the game other than just being like a mechanic where you go around turning people off which is basically how death is handled in lots of games and um and so in our game it um so for instance uh, um, our game isn't about how people died and in fact all of the dead people in the game um you you don't really find out how they died it's not important the game's about how they lived and about the, the lives that they lived and how people remember them and how people miss them as well and and i think in that sense it it, it it's a, th a thing that i'm probably quite proud of with this game is it's it's a game that reflects on death in the way that we think about death in our own lives like i you know like i for instance when i think about my dad who died 
I don't think about how he died or why he died. I think about the things that we did together when he was alive, and and I, and, and and that's how you think about dead people, and that's how you miss them, and um, and that's and they, how you make them real. Yeah, exactly. Like yeah, doing the game. Yeah, and at the same time, we also wanted to make this make a game about how dead people feel about being dead, which is obviously like a ridiculous idea. You know, this notion of being a, being a ghost and being dead. You know, he, you know, the game is called I Am Dead, and the guy starts the game by saying, "Oh, by the way, I'm dead." You know, and um, he has this kind of quite matter of fact approach to being dead. He's not very happy about it, but he's kind of making the best of the opportunity, you know, making the best of a bad opportunity or bad situation. And he's just trying to figure it out as he goes along. And the other dead people he meet are also kind of a bit like, it's almost like being dead is just kind of a, is part of life in a way for them. And, and, and they're all just trying to wrap their heads around it. And I've always liked stories, that are, things that are like that. Um, like a thing that me and Ricky talked about a lot was the movie Beetlejuice, you know, the Tim Burton movie Beetlejuice, which is about a family who are dead and 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 don't even kind of realise that they're dead. And then once they do, they have to kind of jump through all the kind of bureaucratic loop hoops of like filling in various forms that you have to fill in once you're dead. And and it's, uh, you know, in the afterlife and and it's a kind of gentle humour all around that, you know, and, and I really, really like that. And I guess our game kind of tackles it in the same way. Kat, it seemed like you maybe had some thoughts about approaching death in this kind of way. And maybe you could talk about other media. You know, you write for television and film and things. How does the approach in games differ the, from, that you've seen? Well, I, I mean, the thing, I've, I've not written any other games. So I, I, my only experience is working <laughs> with Dick and Ricky, which was lovely because it felt genuinely collaborative. You know, we would go to a museum or to, or we'd meet, you know, somewhere in a skate park somewhere and we just talk about the ideas you know I, I might have sent some stories and everybody would look at them or, or Dick might have had some drawings and we'd all and talk about them I mean what I was saying about uh, memory is that really for for any individual most other people are always just made of memories you know that's how we that's how we envisage people even if they're real, you know, our memories are not necessarily them, but it's just a part of them. And it, it there's so much interesting thing about existence, which this game just touches on, because obviously you don't want to talk about that. You want to find the hidden things and look through things. But um, they're really interesting topics about, you know, what does what does what makes a person? Is it how you think about them? how the other person thinks about them is it if enough people think about you that makes you entire there's a lot of quite interesting little ideas and about uh, how yeah how we think of ourselves and how we think of other people and again i totally agree with dick very often you know as a somebody who is outside of games you're a uh, cliche of game death is sort of instant and relentless and they're not a person they're nothing they they they're not of any interest whereas in this game the it, the people who are dead are you actually have to be interested in them i think also the, the these these sort of these themes play really nicely into like you know what this game also is is a whole collection of physical objects like it's quite a, mm. it's a very kind of materialistic game in the sense of there are lots of objects and those objects you're going to spend a lot of time digging through them and 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 I'm, I'm peeling apart a cupboard and then finding an object inside that and then an object inside that and you know in this game all those objects are you know belongings of a person you know they're they're or they're, 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 they're they have real meaning and and in many cases in the game they have you know bits of text that appear when you put your cursor over an object and it'll tell you more about that object and you know in some cases there's quite a lot of extra information about the you know that you learn about the character through these little you know through their stuff basically like it's kind of it's kind of a strange voyeuristic game where you're like rooting through this person's stuff <laughs> and 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 experiencing all these kind of you know memories of them um yeah but that's pretty interesting because i was going to ask cat you know cat said oh you don't want to delve into this topic too much because you want to get back to finding the objects and i was wondering oh maybe this being a game 
in some ways gets in the way of the story. But it sounds like from what you're saying, Ricky, that actually it it helps the story because, you know, you couldn't do this kind of thing in a film. Maybe you have the camera focusing in on each individual object to show you something that means something to a person who's died. But I guess it wouldn't have the same effect, right, because of the, the player choice and the, the interactivity of it. Yeah, like the, the player has total control over whether they just follow the absolute quickest path through. You know, you can just play this game where you just view each memory, quickly find the object, view the next memory, find the object, and you can play the game like that. But, you know, the game never asks you to do that, and you can spend as much time as you want. There's no time pressure. You can spend as much time as you want just rooting around all this stuff, looking inside stuff, you know, just spending time in the places. And, you know, uh, from speaking to people who've played the game since it got released, that's definitely a way that people are playing the game is just like hanging out in these spaces. And, like, you know, there's some stuff to do that's very, you know, specific like video game puzzle stuff. But it's also just a place with a lot of interesting stuff in it as well. Um, yeah. There's no time peril, but there is thematic peril. So you've got the, uh, the the driving force uh, kind of taking Morris through the game and, and driving him to find these other ghosts to ask if they will be custodians of the island is that there is a volcano that is about to, to go off. How did you come to that decision to incorporate that aspect into the story? And did it come easily or were there maybe disagreements about that? <laughs> It was in your drawing. I think the first map of Shelmiston I, you ever showed me, Dick, had a volcano in it. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of I can't remember where this this um, this sort of theme came about. But it's been there. It was there from quite early on, and I found it in, as we as we went on with with working out the structure of this game. I I personally had difficulty with it. Because it felt like it was the more the more and more we came up with who these people are and the, and the stories and working with Cat on 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 developing these characters and, and the stories around them, the more it felt like it was about um, the kind of um, about them and their lives and it and the, and the more it felt like a kind of crass thing to have this big dramatic the world's going to end shit going on as well. That felt like it was kind of going against the grain of the more sort of um, the more domestic level kind of storytelling that, that we were doing. And and I found it hard to reconcile those two things. And there was a few meetings where I think I was very much at odds, maybe with Ricky and some other people working on the game who aren't who aren't on this call um, with all that stuff. It all it all felt. Um, it felt a bit too video gamey and it felt like that was at odds with a lot of a lot of what else was going on in the game but then cat applied herself to that problem and did a lot of writing around that especially towards the end of the game where where this stuff pans out and as i sort of read in read drafts of that stuff it actually I actually was, I had a really emotional response to it and it and when I, I remember reading like one of Kat's sort of drafts of the of the very end of the game and uh, and you know the writing at the very end of the game and, and and feeling quite you know it kind of made me feel very emotional and and so in the end I'm, I'm glad it I'm glad we've got all that volcano stuff in the game um, and I think we do it at a, I think the the extent to which it, it does or doesn't interfere with the with all the other storytelling that happens i think we've got it about right i don't know ricky you might have more to say on that than me yeah i mean there were definitely points where it was way more heavy-handed than it is now um and i think that i think we ended up just leaning on it just enough to give the to give the characters a push through the narrative and through the story and to kind of send send morris on a journey where you know he he you know by the end of the game there is some stuff at stake and he 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 you know it, it is on a kind of knife edge but it definitely doesn't feel like that the whole way but it's just very subtly there in the background i think it was it was a real balancing act it was again it was a problem solving you know there were lots of iterations where it felt too much or not enough or too confusing there was like you know how do you exp at what point do you explain all these things like there was a real like there was almost a point where we had to like just figure out what we were going to tell the player when and what order we were going to try and tackle this this exposition in um, and then gradually, as we iterated at that, as Kat's script, you know, passes, iterated at that, it, it got easier and better. I think once we got that, the stuff about Aggie and her world in, then it, it, it and the, that, how that resurfaced in the now of Shelmiston, I think that was 
the trick of it. Yeah, because you don't just want, oh no, a volcano erupts, you know. And it it is a sort of special place, Shelmiston. You know, it's not like. It's not yeah, like you're, Kat, you're nearly talking about a thing that's secret. <laughs> <laughs> like it's Are a we twist, allowed to contextualise who Aggie is? Very, uh, yeah, Aggie's slightly, awesome. yeah. She's the the bog woman who has lived in the. You know, when you if in in real life in the real world, there's quite a lot of bodies that have been uh, that from bro the Bronze Age that have been. They usually murder victims or they've fallen in a bog. But because of the nature of their bog, their the bog, their bodies preserved. And there's one of these people in um, Ogden's museum, and it's Aggie. So you, she's there all the time. She's been dead longest, really. Yeah, she yeah. definitely has. Yeah, an interesting um, aspect. Yeah, I don't want to talk any more about that stuff because I, I don't want to spoil <laughs> it for people if they play the game. But yeah. yeah, and I would recommend that people play this game. It is, it is brilliant. Um, one thing I want to talk about is the kind of game that it is because I think Ricky, you mentioned this earlier. It is basically a hidden object game, and I was reluctant to say that because hidden object games are so often derided. You know, people look down on them. Uh, they're games that are often popular with women. I think that is one reason for these games where you just are presented with these scenes and you look through them for items. And another thing that I Am Dead made me think of, especially when you're in the museum and you're looking for objects in there, was um, was real life museums who have kind of quote unquote games where you go around looking for parts of the exhibition and ticking them off a list, you know, especially if you're a child, it's like a school activity. So I wondered how much you had that kind of thing in mind, hidden object games and, and real world examples of this and and how much you, yeah, how much you thought of that and how much it, it worried you or didn't. I think I think it's worth saying that you know we didn't start off knowing that this was a hidden object game. I mean, it is a, it is essentially a hidden object game. It, it, you know, it's in three D, um, so it's 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 sort of on its surface is quite different. But but in terms of the way that it sort of works, uh, the, the way the sort of loop works, and the way what you're doing, it, it works. It's very similar, a sort of similar feel. Um, but we didn't start out like that. You know, we started out with 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 making objects that sliced and composing them in 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 scenes and rooms and buildings and 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 you know building that world out and thinking about what the world was and you know there there were lots of different versions of what the game could be and and it was only maybe two thirds of the way through development that we were really like okay yeah this is just a game where you're looking for this stuff mm -hmm. um, and then. Uh, yeah, when we made that decision, I was super comfortable with that. I mean, I like hidden object games, and I think it's nice to have made one that's like, you know, we, you know, we've made one that's quite sort of different and has a quite a different art style to to, to what those games typically look like. Um, but I mean, yeah, I, I'm definitely not shying away from the fact that, that that that's kind of the genre that this that this game's in, and hopefully, people that like those games will like I Am Dead. Yeah, I'd be excited to hear from someone like that, you know, who who maybe plays lots of those kinds of hidden object games and then maybe someone tells them about our game and 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 they come come at it from from that point of view and I'd like to know what they think of it you know they probably think it's too easy that would be my <laughs> that'd be my guess because it probably is a lot easier than a lot of those those other hidden object games but um yeah I'd be interested to know to know how they find it Hopefully we'll hear from some of them. Um, we've got about 10 minutes of this discussion left and then we're going to go to Q&A. So if anyone watching has thought of any questions for Dick, Ricky or Kat or, or me, I suppose I'm here too, you can type those into the Q&A box and uh, someone is, is monitoring those. So we'll get to ask them in about 10 minutes. Um, in a minute, we're going to talk about 2020 and how the events of this year have affected the game's development. But before we get to that, I am mindful of the fact that I said to Kat earlier that I was going to ask about what it is like to write your very first game when all of your experience has been in things like television and film. So what has that process been like for you? Well, like I said, I, I mean, it was just really, really good fun. It was a really, really good fun job. I would meet up with Dick and Ricky. We you know, I'd look at drawings, I'd do a bit of writing, I'd send it off. It felt, it felt like, a, like playing in, in the best sort of sense of the word. Um, I, because obviously I wasn't involved with the whole game side of it, like Dick and Ricky. I didn't have any kind of pressure. I was just like, oh, let me go, let me go to Shelmerston and think about people running about in giant shells or strange birds or, or you know, oh, what's going on in the lighthouse? Fish people, <laughs> yes. So it was, it really was a lovely, lovely job. And I didn't feel, I, I felt, 
I felt that my ideas were taken seriously. So I wasn't just like, I wasn't like being a hack, just like, oh, let me do that. I did <laughs> feel like, oh, you know, if I had something to offer that was good, it would it would be taken on board. Um, and I, I got a lot out of it. I really enjoyed spending time in this world with these, not just Dick and Ricky, with these people, with these pretend people. And um, I don't know if it's like, I don't, I don't imagine, or maybe it is, maybe that's what writing games is like, in which case, bring it on. But I'm not <laughs> sure, really, I don't know. I don't know, you know, I mean, obviously I'm aware of like, choose your own adventure books, which I've never written one of those either. But um, I don't know how much, it was so organic, it was so, I felt I was invested in this island. I was invested in these people. I was invested in what it might be like to be dead a bit. You know, if, if you get the chance to have a playground like this to think about, to be in, to muck about in. I mean, such fun. The fish people, the toast, the little things like that. <laughs> I, I, it was just so enjoyable. You know, some of the relationships, the relationship between Sam and, and her husband, the pilot, or his, you know, ah, lovely. I, yeah, Sam's, I, Sam's a fish person and, and the pilot of the ferry is a toucan. Yeah. One, one thing that you touched on there, Kat, is when you mentioned choose your own adventure books, because our game... Um, our, the writing in our game doesn't have that dependency to have to, to write for different outcomes and you know, exactly. branching narratives. And I'd be interested to know how you'd feel about working on a game where you have to write in interactive stories where the player can change the course of the story, whether you'd be interested in doing that. I, I think it would, it would, you know, who were the characters that you were, that were doing this and how does doing X change that character depend on them you know compared with them doing why you know do they just do it is it like pick up a drink uh, a, you know a glass of water or, or pick up a tape measure but you know, <laughs> if you pick up the tape measure what does that mean for them that's what I'm really how's it going to change them the tape measure, you know well okay it sounds like you are open to more games writing opportunities <laughs> if, if it's fun I, I like I like a bit of fun. I think what this was was absolute. That just the, the range of people, the the things that they could do, the thinking about them. I'm thinking of um, Valerie Uchim in the in the the sculpture park, and and the, there were animals. You know, the, we had animals. We had dogs, not just dogs, but it was great. It was really good. Oh yeah, there are memories of animals, aren't there, that can talk. And knitting, I could impose some of my likes on, on the whole world. So there's a lot of knitting. <laughs> there's a lot of things in this game that are just things that we're into. And I, I, I have no apology for that whatsoever. Like stuff that we just happen to be really into. I think that's, that true, of all, you, that's true of all our games, right? Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah the way so. we make games. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of things in I Am Dead that I'm very into. I especially liked slicing into all of the cakes to look inside <laughs> Battenberg and Swiss rolls and things like that. That was very entertaining. Um, we've got about five minutes until we hand over to the audience Q&A, but uh, I think it would be remiss of us not to talk about 2020 and how the pandemic has affected the development of your game. So the development of I Am Dead started before coronavirus hit. It came out in the midst of the pandemic. How did that affect the development process and how you worked together? Um, so uh, Hollow Ponds is a remote studio. Um, so just on the, a really basic practical level, it didn't massively affect our like day-to-day -day working. So we have a studio in London where myself and, and, and one of the producers on the game would go you know, every day and that couldn't happen anymore. But to be honest, by then we were just at the point of just like, you know, by the, by, by the time March happened and we were, we were not able to leave the house, we were pretty much just working away at our sort of final lists of things for, you know, the last six months of a game is basically just working through to-do lists of like all the things you have to finish and polish and fix. And um, in some ways it was almost helpful to not have like the distraction of being able to like, oh, I'd, I'd love to just knock off work at five o'clock and go to the pub and the sun's shining, but I can't. So I might as well just sit here and fix this pub. <laughs> like, there was a sense in which, you know, it wasn't too bad in that way. 
Um, it definitely didn't affect us in a like a kind of big shed. You know, we didn't really have teething problems of like, how are we going to not work now that we can't all see each other? Because we were already working like that anyway. Mm. Yeah. Um, I think the other thing that was specifically, I think was actually kind of helpful um, was that, you know, normally when you're when you're trying to finish a video game, there's like, you know, you, you need to get on a plane and fly to various games conferences where you show your game publicly and do lots of interviews and press. And although that's often quite fun and, and you know, and, and, and enjoyable, it's often incredibly time consuming and tiring at a point when you're just trying to finish the game and make the game the best thing it can be. And, and instead of doing that, we essentially did that same thing with journalists, but on, on Discord, on the internet, where we would just show, you know, screen share the game for them and talk through the game with them. And that experience was actually pretty good as well, I think. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. Like yeah. someone, I'm I'm trying to fly as little as possible, and that was a revelation to me because I was dreading having to fly because of you know because of promoting this game, and instead being able to do it all um you know over over you know like like how we're doing this talk now uh, mm-hmm. was yeah it worked really well it was great. So if this had happened, if if coronavirus had happened a year or two earlier, I think it would have had a much worse impact on this game. When Kat was talking a few minutes ago about how fun it was, all the meetings that we had and like going to museums and and just, you know, like when you're doing that kind of work where you're just trying to think up stories and, and, and work out who these characters are, quite often you're just sat drinking tea together and you might like your conversation might drift off in, in ways that it probably won't on a conference call. And you, you're looking at things and you're looking, you're all looking at the same piece of paper where you're mm-hmm. writing notes down and scribbling things. And, and there's just a there's a more real sense of camaraderie of, you know, and um, yeah, what, one of the main locations in this game is a museum. And, and we had an amazing day that we spent together at an actual museum that we, you know we took a lot from that both in terms of like little things like just the colors that they paint the insides of of the vitrines in a museum but also just the kinds of things that they have in museums and just the feel of the place and we had a you know that creative meeting that we had in that museum Mm -hmm. was was such an essential thing that happened in the making of this game and obviously that wouldn't we couldn't do that at the moment Mm -hmm. and that's really you know that makes me feel really sad actually for people you know for both for our next game and and also for people that are doing other kinds of creative endeavors, you know, uh, um, at the moment elsewhere. Mm-hmm. So hopefully this will affect the future in ways like, for instance, maybe we won't be expected to fly as much, which will be beneficial to the environment, be beneficial to to people all around the world who maybe don't have as easy access to go to events like GDC and things like that. But yeah. on the flip side, hopefully we will all be able to gather in person again safely soon uh, for collaborations like the one that was so crucial to this game. Well, thank you so much, Dick, Ricky and Kat for answering my questions. Uh, We are now going to hand you over to the audience for their questions. So I think somebody else is going to read the questions out. Yes, that would be me. Uh, first, thank you for an insightful, uh, insightful chat. Uh, from the amount of questions we have received, it's obvious that uh, the audience has um, that the audience have enjoyed it uh, as well. Uh, f- uh, firstly, um, uh, we have to give uh, we have to uh, uh, Jordan. You've gotten greetings from Sarajevo. Oh. Uh, People are. <laughs> I yeah, miss people, you, Sarajevo. People would like to see you there again. <laughs> when it's Hopefully, safe to do so, I will come when back. It's safe to do so, yeah, we we will all <laughs> gather gather there. Uh, firstly, let's start off uh, with uh, a technical question. So, uh, this is your first 3D game. Uh, what game engine did you use to develop it? It's Unreal Engine, um, and we'd never used it before. Um, and there was a pretty big learning curve and it would have been better to learn Unreal Engine making a game that's more like a normal 3D game rather than one where you have to render all the insides of everything. (laughs) I I don't, my advice to anyone like making their first 3D game is Unreal Engine's good. Use the things that Unreal Engine's good at rather than trying to make some crazy thing that's really, really hard to even understand how to make it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> okay, awesome. Uh, our second question is uh, actually uh, about um, 
ab about the game, like what makes it uh, different than any, any other like hidden object game? And like, could you share what is uh, I am dead uh, uh, unique uh, selling point or unique feature that makes it uh, stand out from other adventure and puzzle games? Uh, shall I take this as well? Yeah, sounds uh, like it. Yeah. So, I, so, so, it, it, in terms of how it's different from a normal hidden object game, I mean, the, the whole game is three D. So, so any object uh, in the game, you you know, you have a cursor, like a hidden object game, you have a cursor. But unlike a hidden object game where you're just moving around a, a flat picture, you, you can lock onto objects in three D and isolate them. Then you can rotate them and slice them away in real time. So you can, you know, any object you can spin it round, slice in, and then you can then move your cursor and, and, and pick ob other objects, which you then isolate. So quite a lot of the the exploring is almost like drilling down through a three D hierarchy, and the whole time you're like in real time slicing away the outsides of things. Um, which means that if you you know if you slice halfway into something and you spin it then you get all this kind of amazing geometry that happens just as a result of the slice plane cutting through the 3d 3d stuff and then um we also do a bunch of stuff where like um you know the the, the main sort of thrust of the game is you're finding these mementos that are like the belongings of people that you find from memories but then there are also these other kinds of puzzle which are more like finding a 3d cross section so like there are there are things you have to find where you're just given a weird wobbly shape and it's like, OK, well, what in this room will make that weird wobbly shape uh, if you slice it in the right way? And you have to kind of look at this this flat picture, which is like a kind of abstract thing and be like, OK, well, I reckon that could be that if we took that and sliced, rotated it and sliced through that way, I reckon that would give you this kind of shape. And and it's kind of different, unique sort of puzzle that you can only really do if you you know have a game in which you slice through stuff so so i think that's kind of pretty uh, that's i guess the most unique thing gameplay terms that comes out of, of i'm dead Definitely. um and then what makes it different as a as a story and writing i i think it's just got i don't know it's it's our story and it's our our characters and our world and and yeah like there's, there's there's no there's no like there's no incredible innovation in that stuff in video game terms like we have conversations between characters that are like conversations between characters in lots of other games and you know there's no like clever storytelling twists we kind of using the, the the mechanics of how games tell stories pretty much you know all the time it's just it's our world and it's our characters and our stories awesome still keeping it keeping it in the technical realm um, um on what platforms is uh, i am dead available at the moment um, uh, right yeah, Sorry, I, I can answer this. It's currently available on Nintendo Switch and PC. And on PC, it's you can get it on either Steam or the Epic Game Store. Um, and it's probably going to come out on other platforms, but we can't really say when at the moment. OK, thank you. Uh, so are there any particular games or movies that inspire the story of, uh, of I Am Dead? Like, what do you, what did you uh, drew your uh, influences uh, from? Oh goodness gracious! Um, it, it's really complicated because all all over the place, you know, like we, me, Ricky, and also Cat, we we constantly talk about all this different stuff that we're into and interested in, and um, and it, ultimately, it's really hard to point to one particular thing where you say, oh, it's like this. You know, it's 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 kind of impossible, really. Um, like I can talk about the place, like the, the place is inspired, as we said earlier, the place is inspired a lot by the town of Hastings where me and Kat live, mm. but it's also inspired by Topsham, the, the place where I was when I first tried writing those initial stories. And it's also a bit like some islands um, the, off the coast of Britain, like the Scilly Isles or, or Guernsey and Sark. And, um, yeah. and it's kind of a mixture of all those things. Um, but not really that much like any of them, really. Um, yeah, that's uh, as close as I can get to being specific about it, about kind of inspirations, really. Yeah, I think there's lots and lots and lots of things. It's it's whole lifetimes of of, you know, cliches about seaside towns, real and imagined. Lots of yeah. things. Yeah, what, what, uh, now that we mentioned like seaside towns, uh, I read uh, I, uh, I've been reading like comments um, and uh, reviews of the game and actually a lot of people are saying uh, how the game doesn't like push them to uh, doesn't push them like to do anything how they are actually like enjoying being 
in the town uh, and exploring every little little detail uh, detail of it and how um, and how because of the surroundings and of the of the of the game mechanics and also uh, they're praising the the voice acting and sound sound design how it actually like, makes them feel as if I don't know as if it was like their town like they Hmm. They, they don't they don't want that is they don't want to they don't want the, the game to finish like they don't want to escape it that's yeah it's a nice place to hang out yeah it's a nice place to hang out yeah, yeah. making do, doing the audio design was really fun and doing the voice acting you know the, the the process of casting performers and and then kind of directing them and and then editing the script as well like tweaking the script and just just really like like t turning the knobs on like how well you can deliver those those sort of stories was like quite a new experience for us and I really really enjoyed that aspect of it. Um, I love the music as well, Vic Mars' soundtrack is just amazing, it really sort of, it really works as like a, uh, it really gives you the sense of the place, his music has a very, um, a very kind of, it, it's kind of you know, it's kind of electronic and it's quite sort of folky but it's also just has a very sort of English vibe to it that, that sort of really feels right for Shelmerston. Um, but yeah, I'm it's it's kind of a generous game in the sense of how much like stuff there is. There's that you can definitely spend a bunch of time just like hanging out, looking looking through stuff that's not really part of the you know the video game part of like solving pro problems. It's just stuff to look at and and, and mm -hmm. explore. Yeah. Yeah, people people are people are especially enjoying uh, being able like to look inside of inside of things and yeah, it's. It's like the the the, be, the feature that is being uh, commented on on the on the most. Uh, speaking of uh, town and town folk folks, um, what would be like your favorite character in the game? Oh, I I I think mine mine I I like Sam very much. Mm. The fish person. Sam's one of the uh, so Sam's one of the ghosts that you have to find. And Sam is a fish person, so they're not human. They're they're a, a person who almost like um, an aquatic um, creature, but a humanoid creature that lives in the sea. But they they've come and, and made a life for themselves on dry land, and they've become the harbour master of the um, yeah. of the town. Yeah, I, th yeah, I love that character. Yeah, I like Sam. I think I'm trying to think who my favourite character is. I know it sounds weird, but I think my favourite character is Greg, who's the kind of the guy that owns the campsite. <laughs> he's the only character who's not a nice. He's like re really not he's a nice so person. Grumpy. He's really grumpy, <laughs> and and um, I really wanted him to be more grumpy. Actually, I really like the idea of having a character who's not a bad guy. You know, he's not like a he's not evil. He's not like the enemy, but he's someone who you have to talk to and get on with. And and you know, he's but he's also just a di massive dickhead <laughs> and. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I and I yeah I really love him yeah yeah but you can walk away from him because it's in the game you don't have to actually you know you can choose to spend time with him or not yeah unfortunately though Kat, in real life there are people who we sometimes have to spend time with who who true. I like that as well yeah <laughs> my my, fav my favorite is these kids that I, I'm sharing my screen there's there's these these two kids um and they are in most of the levels in the game and they're always just getting up to some trouble. They're always just like, oh. there's no, there's very rarely a grown up directly with them. They're probably about five and seven. And because Shelmerston is a relatively safe place for kids to roam around and, and like, you know, get into trouble, they're just always just off doing something they probably shouldn't necessarily be doing. <laughs> they're kind I of like an Easter egg, aren't on they? The boat. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and, the, and the grandma is like sitting on the bench with her back to them. Yeah, she's, she's had like, enough. She's just like, oh, she should be looking. They're inspired by a very, very specific thing, which is um, in the Richard Scarry. I don't know if you know the child, sort of American children's illustrator, Richard Scarry. He always had these characters who were tramps. And in every single Richard Scarry drawing, somewhere, not every single one, but most, most Richard Scarry drawings where there's lots of stuff going on in, say, a town, somewhere in somewhere you can find the tramps and they're always getting up to trouble. And we, uh, yeah, I remember talking about that with Ricky and thinking, yeah, we should do that. We should have some characters that are like a kind of, like they, they never cross over with gameplay. They never have anything to do with the gameplay, really. They're literally just a background, they're background characters that you can always find. And then you go, oh yeah, there's those guys again, you know, and that's. We also have a one-eyed seagull, Gillespie the one-eyed seagull, who's always eating something. 
<laughs> awesome. Uh, regarding the um, uh, the game's uh, really striking art style, can you uh, share like what um, what illustrators or what artists or what video games or um, or movies uh, uh, influenced um, the the aesthetics of uh, I Am Dead? Oh goodness gracious, that's that's a hard question. Um, I really should stop, stop asking these questions about influences. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. So I t talked earlier about Lisa Hannawalt and about how that that was an definitely an inspiration in terms of like feeling okay with having characters that are not human. Um, but in terms of like the actual visual, the actual the way the game looks, like it's the, so it's the first game with. Um, with like three dimensional art that I've ever worked on and I don't really have any skills Well, I do now more, but at the time when we started on the game, I didn't really have any skills in that area. Um, but I was able to draw things that perhaps looked like they were um, in a three dimensional game environment, as long as they were quite um, simple and colorful. Everything I do is quite simple and colorful anyway. On my on my screen, which I'm sharing now, these are a couple of illustrations that were like before oh, yeah, we even started, before there even was a game at all, before we even figured out how to do the tech. Dick did these drawings, which were like, I guess, like you know, they're kind of 3D, aren't they? They're like they're you trying to sort of guess what the game could look like if if you could really slice through this this stuff. Yeah, in terms of like games that I've seen, like I was trying to think of like game. In terms of like games that I've seen where I thought, oh, that's a that's a kind of aesthetic which is maybe closer to something that I could do than a kind of photorealistic thing. Maybe like the first game I remember like that was Jet Set Radio. You know, like I remember when Jet Set Radio, um, I pretty much bought a Dreamcast just so I could play Jet Set Radio because I was so excited by a game that had that kind of, you know, it was a three dimensional game, but it had that kind of weird tune shady thing going on, which probably has become quite a cliche now, but at the time was really like, it just blew my mind. I was like, this game looks amazing. Yep. And then more, more recently when I like approaching the kind of process of, um, of how this game might look, I, you know, I remember talking to Ben Esposito who made uh, Donut County who is a guy that we know and, and have hung out with a lot over the years. And that game is published by the same people that published our game. And we hung out with him a bunch um, while he was making working on that game. And and um, and so it was nice to talk to someone who was making a game in that kind of flat color, low poly style and and and, and try and sort of think think about how to get my own kind of um, find my own voice in that art style, I guess, if that makes sense. It does, it does. Thank you for being so, uh, f for the thorough answer. Okay. Uh, yeah, now, now I'd like to uh, ask um, Kat a question, uh -huh. since uh, this is your first time writing for video games. Um, what are like the lessons that you would uh, take, um, take from this work? And uh, as a writer, of course, and uh, would you like to uh, continue uh, writing for for video games in the future? Um, I think, yeah, it is the first one, but I, as as the others have, well, I don't know, Dick and Ricky obviously have made lots of games. I've never worked in a game. I don't know if this is, I don't know if making games is something that everybody does the same way. So I don't know. So my experience of it, like I said, it was a really good one. Um, it, what was the best thing about it was the level of collaboration, was the fact that nobody's, there was no hierarchy of ideas, you know? Uh, so, and that's where a lot of good stuff comes out, I think, in any kind of work. You know, if you have that space where people can say, what what's on their mind even if it's ridiculous and then they you know you're not going to be slapped down like, oh, that's, you know everything is on the table um so that sort of experience because i've worked in telly where it's not like that for a lot of the time it was extremely refreshing to have that you know anything can go if it's a good idea we'll run with it you know if that if that sounds interesting or maybe that would work with this or let's give that a go so that kind of openness which i i don't know if that's 
a general thing or if that is to do with being lucky uh, enough to work with these guys i'd like to think that's true with in other you know other places especially the sort of people making games on the kind of scale that we we work like indie yeah. studios i guess but I, I obviously I can't speak for other, other yeah. studios. I'd like to flip that at, that question on its head and say me and Ricky are thinking of writing a book. <laughs> 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 Our next game is not going to be a game. It's going to be a book. I can't recommend writing books. I'm okay. afraid. <laughs> Wouldn't do it. Uh, Dick and Ricky, a question for you now. Um, what advice would you give to game designers or teams who are looking to find people to collaborate, but uh, who are outside of video games, like such yeah. as writers, illustrators, musicians? Yeah, so that's that's generally a thing that we we've done. Like when I started working with Dick, he was he was from outside of video games. He's not allowed to claim that anymore. I don't think <laughs> at this point. But um, but yeah, over the years we have generally worked with lots of people. You know, um, musicians, um, animators. Um, writers um, who, yeah, who, who, yeah, who have no experience of making video games at all and and I think we'll continue doing that um, and I think a lot of our, our collaborations are pretty organic you know it, it the, the reason we're working with Kat is because you know Dick knows Kat from Hastings and it was just a conversation it was just like, oh yeah we th this is a thing we could do um, you know the way that we've worked with voice actors in the game we're just like you know one of the person one of the um, the actors that did a lot of the um, voices for the memories is just someone I met on holiday <laughs> and who turned out to be a voice actor who did like you know lots of audio books and also some video games and we just stayed in touch and it's like yeah, but how, how does that answer the question like if you want to get into games what, what's go on go go to the same holiday places as <laughs> 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 yeah i mean i would say i would say that um that like over the years we have you, you you can definitely make collaborations happen organically you know you don't have to like go to the place where where you can you know you can you can collaborate with all kinds of people um and and like oh, a thing you can do is just ask them if they want to be involved and then see where that goes i guess um or oh, will you work uh, as a as as a team together on your next title? Are you having um, any plans about um, about that? About your future projects together? We are with our next game. We are go. We, we, you know, we kind of we're going back to just being me and Dick for a while, just figuring out what we want to make next. Um, I think that's our, our general. You know, our, our general process for making games is that it usually starts off with just the two of us really making a thing until we figure out what the thing is. And then we bring people in to work with, you know, when we kind of have a sense of what is going to be, you know, what, what people we might need to work with. Um, and sometimes those are people that we've worked with before. And sometimes they're like, you know, so with I Am Dead, it was like, oh, we're going to need some people who know how to do 3D modeling and 3D animation. And, you know, some people, we, you know, didn't know. So it's like start asking around. Let's start sort of figuring out who those people might be. Um, so yeah, it's it's it, you know, Holo, uh, uh, the studio Hollow Ponds doesn't really have any full time employees. You know, all of our all of our staff are kind of freelance, and every game we work with, you know, a different sort of set of people, and and some of them we've worked with on multiple projects, and some of them we work with for the first time on I'm Dead. So, I think it's important to say at that point that you um that, that that's a that's a relationship that suits both parties. That all all of the people that we work with are people that want to work in that way, and don't want full time jobs at a studio, and and are happy, you know, to go and to work on our game for a while and then go and work somewhere else and I, I, I think that we, um, we we try and make sure that's the case. Would you agree with that Ricky? Yeah and in fact you know in fact especially with um, you know like both on Ho Ho Command on I Am Dead there were people doing um, uh, you know art 3D modeling or animation who during the course of making I Am Dead worked on other things you know they would they would do a bunch of work and then they would go off and do and work on another job and then and then come back and work on I Am Dead again. Um, and that that you know that there's something cool about that there's something nice about like having you know it, it's almost like you're at a party and people are drifting in and out and you sort of you know like there's a kind of ever slightly shifting set of people that you're you're dealing with every day it feels really nice um yeah rather than you know rather than having all these people like having to find things for them to do all the time it's more it's much more sort of organic than that yeah awesome well um We've uh, you've shared a lot tonight, and like thank you so much uh, for for getting for for getting together uh, with us and sharing your ideas behind the game, your creative processes, your ways of collaboration, 
and um, especially for sharing your thoughts about the important uh, topics um, uh, your game um, touches on. Um, with this, we will have to um, wrap this salon. And um, on behalf of British Council and our audience, uh, I would really like to thank you all uh, for uh, being um, for being our guests um, guests tonight and uh, for uh, for kicking off this um, uh, this first uh, salon in um, uh, in uh, yeah at Play UK Festival. Um, so uh, our next salon will be yeah. Please remember that uh, this session will be recorded and uploaded to British Council's uh, website and YouTube channel, so we can uh, so we can all revisit it whenever we whenever we want to. And um, also, I would like to uh, share that our next salon will be held on 11th of November, and that our uh, guest speaker will be uh, Stephanie Ijoma a gamer, a streamer and a founder of Naseg, Naseg, uh, a UK gaming platform that promotes uh, diverse voices and creates safe spaces within the games industry. So please make sure to join us on 11th October, on 11th of November, I apologize. Um, again, a big thanks to all of our speakers and uh, see you next time. <laughs>